Sentence pattern three, complex sentences. The complex sentence consists of an independent clause connected to one or more dependent clauses. Dependent clauses begin with words known as subordinating conjunctions. The following is a list of subordinating conjunctions. After, although, as, as if, as though, because, before, even though, if, in order that, once, rather than, since, so that, than, though, unless, until, when, whenever, where, wherever, whether, and while. These are the most common of the coordinating conjunctions excuse me, subordinating conjunctions. Um, when you are working with a subordinating conjunction, sometimes you have a word that can also be a preposition. And you're thinking, wait a minute, in module one, you said after was a preposition. Now you're saying that after is a subordinating conjunction. I'm confused, which is it? Well, it's both. <laughs> if after is followed by a noun is a prepositional phrase. After is the preposition. Um, if you say after the party, uh, after is the preposition and party is the object of the preposition. But if you say after the party was over, then now you've got the subordinating conjunction after, it's followed by a subject, the party, and now you have a verb. And what do we call groups of words that have subjects and verbs? We call them clauses. And what type of clause is this? Independent or dependent? After the party was over. This is a dependent clause. What happened after the party was over? We don't have a clue. The only way we're going to find out is to join the dependent clause to an independent clause to form a complex sentence. That's what we're going to be practicing here. Now, I know this sounds silly. I sound silly even saying it, but I invented an acronym for subordinating conjunctions. Boo, boo is wah, wah, wah. And as silly as that sounds, my students can all, almost always remember boo, boo is wah, wah, wah. They're not likely to remember a long list of subordinating conjunctions. What can the B stand for in boo-boo? Well, it can stand for because. Um, you, the U can stand, stand for unless. The B can stand for before. The U can stand for until. The I can stand for if. The S can stand for since, and so forth. It's just a way of helping you recall those words when you may have forgotten what they mean. So we talked about the fact that a dependent clause after the party was over has to be connected to an independent clause in order to make sense. So as a writer, how do you decide how to do that? Well, you have two choices. The first is to put the dependent clause first, use a comma, and then follow it with an independent clause. Although I wanted to leave the house in a hurry, I could not find my keys. I hope you can hear my, the frustration in my voice. Because my daughter was sick, I had to miss class. The comma following the introductory dependent clause is not optional. If you have difficulty deciding where to insert the comma, try reading the sentence aloud. You may be able to hear where the comma should go, and that's because the comma is going at the point where the dependent clause and the independent clause are coming together. It's a very common comma rule. Although I wanted to leave the house in a hurry, I could not find my keys. Because my daughter was sick, I had to miss class. Read the sentence aloud, listen for your voice, and I believe that you will hear that you can read that sentence correctly and by listening to yourself read, you will find where the comma goes. Now the other alternative is also clear. Um, we can put the independent clause first and then the dependent clause. When the independent clause is 
uh, followed by the dependent clause, there is not a comma to connect them. The subordinating conjunction does the work uh, that is needed to connect the two. I could not find my keys, although I wanted to leave the house in a hurry. Or, I had to miss class because my daughter was sick. Observe that no comma appears between the clauses. That's because the subordinating conjunctions, because in the uh, first sentence, all, uh, excuse me, although in the first sentence and because in the second sentence, pardon the mistake in the notes here, are so powerful that no punctuation is needed. Subordinate conjunctions can really become your friends when you are trying to express complex ideas because many of the papers that you write in college, you will be, have, you will be showing cause and effect. And so it's important that you learn um, more sophisticated ways of joining sentences together. And that is the purpose of this lesson. Now that you've learned how to identify simple, compound, or complex sentences, let's practice. Look at the following sentences. Are they simple, compound, or complex? One of the most interesting animals in the rainforest is the dart poison frog. In module one, you learned how to identify prepositional phrases. Please note that the same kinds of principles apply here. So if we mark through prepositional phrases, we're going to expose the subject and the verb. All right, so we're looking for the verb. We know that there is a word here that is always a verb and that is the verb is. We also know that there, the subject is one. So you have one subject, one verb. There is only one type of sentence that can be, and that is a simple sentence. Okay, let's go to the second one. The dark poison frog measures one inch in length, comma, and it is blue, orange, or yellow in color. The reason that I read the sentence that way is because there's a specific pattern here that you should recognize from earlier in our discussion. What you're seeing here is the use of a coordinating conjunction, comma, and, and the coordinating conjunction is found in which type of sentence? Well, let's look again and identify the subjects and the verbs. So we have a verb on this side, measures. What measures? Simple subject is frog. It is blue, orange, or yellow in color. Again, the, the word that is always a verb is the verb is. The subject is it. Since we've got now a simple subject, frog, and a verb measures, and another simple subject, it and is, we know that we have a compound sentence because of the presence of the coordinating conjunction and. So this is compound, which I am just going to abbreviate as CMPD. Perhaps the dark poison frog is a bright color to warn its enemies, for the poison is deadly. Now what you've got here is a word, a fanboy, which we've learned these are, um, these are called. A fanboy right here, comma four. Now the test to see whether this word is a fanboy's is to make sure there's a subject and a verb on either side. Exact same thing we did in number two. Let's look then for verbs. On this side, you've got is as the verb, subject frog. On this side, you've got is, subject poison. You've got a subject verb on either side connected by a coordinating conjunction for, which is one of the fanboys. Again, you have a compound sentence. Number four, the effectiveness of the frog's poison is well known. Native Americans sometimes use the poison on the darts for their blowguns. 
Again, let's see if we've got two independent clauses. On the one side, we have is of the frog's poison is a prepositional phrase. The subject then is effectiveness. On the other side, we've got the verb use. We've got Native Americans as the subject, but we have a telltale sign here. What is it? Mm, it's that semicolon. That semicolon is sitting right at the point as it should where two independent clauses come together. We have two independent clauses. We have a compound sentence. The mother dart poison frog carries her tadpoles on her back. We have one verb, carries. We have one subject, frog. We have a simple sentence. She carries them to a bromeliad plant growing in a tree, and then she enters the rainwater in the plant's center. Again, we have a possibility of a fanboy here because we have the coordinating conjunction and, and before that, the comma. Remember that a comma before and means that a subject and verb should appear on either side. Is that the case? Well, you've got a verb carries. You've got a subject, she. On the other side, you've got the verb enters. You've got a subject, she. Once again, you've got a compound sentence. You're probably thinking at this point, am I going to see a complex sentence in this exercise? Probably. Let's keep going. <laughs> Finally, the tadpoles let go and begin life anew uh, <clears throat> in the plan. So you've got the tadpoles let go, let go, actually both those words are functioning as a verb, and then you've got begin. There's an and here, but there is no comma. The subject then is the subject tadpoles. The tadpoles let go and begin a life anew in the plan. Well, based on what I just said, you're probably thinking this is a complex sentence, but it's not. You've got one subject, two verbs, you've got a simple sentence. In this exercise, there are no complex sentences. Next, we'll enter Module 3, and in Module 3, you'll be learning more about sentence structure and what happens when you form simple, compound, or complex um, sentences but have uh, sentence structure errors.